is not my primary residence. Well, we can stall him for a year. <laughs> This is an old number that is once again current and timely. It's called a mod for my own business. Drilling a line between the Johnsons and the ships. Now this plant could be a reasonably pleasant place to live if everyone could just mind his own business and let others do the same. But a wide old black faggot said to me years ago, some people are shit stars. <laughs> I was never able to forget it. Now the shit is incapable of minding his own business because he has no business of his own to mind. And the mark of a hardcore shit is that he has to be right. He is a professional miner of other people's business. And he is compulsively and vociferously right. A prime example of the genre is the late Harry J. Anslinger, former commissioner of narcotics. <laughs> the laws must reflect society's disapproval of the addict. Such people poison the air, we all breathe with the blight of their disapproval. Southern law men feeling their nigger notches. Decent church gone women with those pinched, mean, evil faces. <laughs> Any form of maintenance is immoral, he says, and of course, thus subjecting the obvious solution to the so called drug problem, which is uh, maintenance for those who can't and won't stop using drugs and treatment for those who want to. Now, Johnson, on the other hand, minds his own business. He doesn't rush to the law if he smells pot in the hall. He don't care about the call girl on the second floor, the fags in the back. However, he will give help when help is needed. He won't stand by when someone is drowning or trapped under a burning car. And above all, he will not stand by when animals and children are being abused. He figures things like that is everybody's business. <laughs> now along comes Regan and Nancy, hand in hand. <laughs> no one has the right to mind his own business. <laughs> Difference is not an option. Only outspoken insistence that drug use will not be tolerated. Everyone is obligated to become hysterical at the mere thought of drug use. <laughs> Just as office workers and deaths a year. And crime producing drug, my God. So you're gonna rush into Washington cocktail parties screaming your drug use is intolerable. <laughs> As for the sly traffickers and alcohol bloated with dirty money. Go, speedy on the dead, they deserve the death penalty at least. <laughs> well, it's just ridiculous and disquieting to speculate what may lurk behind this colossal red herring of the war against drugs. Actually, drug use is down, according to the latest statistics, unreliable to be sure they always are. Uh, a, a war neither likely or designed to succeed. Looks like old clean money and new dirty money will be shaking hands under the table as usual. <laughs> and the old tried and failed police approach will continue. In politics, if something doesn't work, that is the best reason to go on doing it. <laughs> if something looks like it might work, stay well away. A thing like that can make waves in 
the boys at the top, they don't like wage. Fifty years ago, deep in the Ural Mountains of Lower Slobovia, a 13-year-old prick named Pavlik Marat denounced his father to the local authorities as a counter-revolutionary kulak. Got a pig head in his face. Now that was when uh, Stalin was starving out the kulaks. Now a kulak is a subsistence farmer, a few acres and a few animals. And Stalin leveraged an outrageous produce tax, knowing that the farmers would hide their crops. Then he sent out patrols to search and seize concealed produce and farm animals. About seven million people starved to death in the winters of 1932 and 33. Three million of them children. Little Podlicki was hacked a strogan off by the outraged neighbors. Good job and all. Thus perish all talking assholes. <laughs> His name must not die, sir, Moxing Gordy. Jesus, how low can a writer sing? <laughs> His heart is acting like painful emotion. So Pavlicki becomes a folk hero. Got a street in Moscow named after him and a statue. He should have been sculpted with the face of a rat. <laughs> the village of Gerasimovka is a shrine drawing legions of youthful pilgrims to the home of public Marazzo. Dirty little stokash. That's Ruski for rap. That's a great word. It's a word designed to be spit out. <laughs> he may be a folk here of the islands. He's just a lousy thing to me. <laughs> And it is happening here. Journal World, October 29. Girl 10, the porch mother's drug use. It's the fourth time a California girl had turned in her parents for, a lot, for alleged drug, drug abuse since August 13th. My mother got a mint one plant growing in a pond. <laughs> Me says that management has the responsibility for surveillance of problem areas such as locker room, toilets above all, <laughs> and nearby carriers and the toilets in the tavern to prevent drug use. It looks to me like Nice and Reagan intend to turn the United States into a nation of rats. <laughs> This is my reconstruction of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Thou shalt not be such a shit you don't know you are one. <laughs> is there anyone in this room who has never said to himself, my God, I acted like an absolute shit. <laughs> If so, let him stand forth so that we may acclaim a latter day saint. I don't want anyone to look at me, for God's sakes. I call an interview with a weakness reporter. He said, Mr. Burroughs, is there anything in your life you regret? Anything you would do differently? You have it to do over. I just let you know my mouth open. <laughs> Well, I'm lucky if I get through a day without something I did wrong. Something I regret when you were talking about a life. <laughs> there are mistakes too monstrous for remorse to tamper or to dally with. That's ever knowing the runs. And one who has never made mistakes like that and paid for his mistakes, I trust him little in the commerce of the soul. No experience. Young thief thinks he has a license to steal. 
Young lawyer never botched a case. Young doctor never killed a patient. Politicians, however, cannot concede that they ever acted any way but the right way. Lying comes as natural as breathing to a politician. <laughs> just about essential for his survival. <coughs> Thou shalt not drop an atom bomb or ship one out in the first place. <laughs> Most 
expensive whores, what can be got? <laughs> if you are doing business with a religious son of a bitch, get it in writing. <laughs>
personnel irreplaceable, some of them. Real soul boom chefs, you might say cordon bleu. <laughs> An interesting detail in the book, the soul killer gives off the smell of burning plastic and rotten oranges. Anything so bizarrely arbitrary is good enough to steal. I'll be reading some trashy sci-fi spy on the speakable horror, and suddenly I do a double take, and I yelp out, gets, 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 good enough to steal. Here's one, a dry, rustling laugh like a snake shedding its skin, gets, gets, gets. <clears throat> well, trial and error, we now have soul killers that don't quit. Stay to the park. Sure, the big part. We know how it's all gonna end. The first sound, the last sound. Meanwhile, all personnel on planet Earth confined to quarters. <coughs> Convincing they got no souls. It's more humane that way. Scientists always said there is no such thing as a soul, and they are now in a position to prove it. <laughs> Total that. Old death. It's what the Egyptians call the second and final death. This awesome power to destroy souls forever is now vested in far-sighted and responsible men in the State Department, the CIA, and the Pope. <laughs> President with his toadies and familiars is now 500 feet down in solid rock. Enough fine food, wines, and liquors to last 200 years and longevity drugs to enjoy. <laughs> A teenage president appears on TV as well cut suit hanging loose on his skinny frame to pipe out in adolescent treble, ultimately pompous and cracking. We categorically deny that there are any crack. So called fountain of youth drugs, procedures, our treatments that are being held back on the American people track. He flashes a boyish smile and runs a comb through his abundant, unruly air. And I categorically dismiss as without foundation that I myself, the First Lady, and my bag son, <laughs> and my colleagues in the cabinet are sustaining ourselves by state-of-the-art vampiric technology. <laughs> Showing off the American pimples crack, giggle, so-called energy units. This hair stand up and crackles and he does the American people a finger. <laughs> story based on the sinking of the Titanic and also on the Moral Castle disaster. Uh, the captain went down on his ship. It was a maiden voyage and a number of rich and fancy people on board, and I think it was Mr. Astor. He and his valet put on full dress suits and said, we are going down like gentlemen, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So King Colonel Clint Smith was right on the deck when the Titanic went down, got clear, and latched onto a chicken coop and survived. And that's the name of the game. Speaking of which, this is a quote. Somewhere in the shadow of the Titanic disaster slinks a cur in human shape. Today, the most despicable human being in all the world. In that grim midnight hour, he found himself hemmed in by the band of heroes whose watchword rang out across the deep. Women and children first. What did he do? He scuttled to the stateroom deck, put on a woman's skirt, a woman's hat, and a woman's 
woman's veil. And picking his crafty way back among the brave and chivalric men who guarded the rail of doom ship, he built a seat in one of the lifeboats and saved his skin. His identity is not yet known, though it will in good time. This man still lives. Surely he was born and saved to set for men a new standard by which to measure into the unchained. <coughs> Um, I don't know, uh, I don't know if they ever found him or not. <laughs> As our story, Twilight's last leavings, the ship's captain puts on women's clothes and swishes into the first lifeboat. And also in this lifeboat is the ship's captain. This was the first appearance of Dr. Fenway. <laughs> Twilight's last leaving with the SS America off Jersey Coast. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no cause for alarm. We have a minor problem in the boiler room, but everything is now under the sound effects of a nuclear blast. <laughs> Explosion splits the boat. A breed named Perkins screams from his a shattered wheelchair. You get the ass on a bit. <laughs> Dr. Benway ships doctor drunk added two inches to a six-inch incision with one stroke of his scalpel. Perhaps the appendix already out, doctor. The nurse said, during duty, he's over his shoulder. I saw a little star. And it's out. <coughs> Take him here, Penny. I think I'm doing it. Perhaps the appendix on the left side, doctor. That's happened sometimes, you know. <laughs> Stop breathing down my neck. I'm coming to that. Down the lawn, searched along the incision, dropping ashes on the cigarette. <laughs> thrust a red fist at her. And get me a new scandal. This one's gotten a wage to it. The doctor flattened against the wall. The patient slid off the operating table, spilling intestines across the floor. Sir, I can't be expected to work under such conditions. <laughs> Let instruments, cocaine, and morphine into his satchel and tilted out of the operating room. Mike Dwyer, politician from Clayton, Missouri, rushed into the first class lounge. He crossed the jukebox, selected the star spangled banner with Pat's terminal at the electric organ, and set up a handful of quarters. Oh, say can you see Captain Kramer putting the finishing touches to heavy makeup. <laughs> now a green cloak hat and a fox stole one of those horrid creations where the fox's mouth forms a class. Rather say Thompson, he decides, slipping a 32 automatic into his handbag. By the dawn's early light, Dr. Benway pushed her across the rail and boarded the first lifeboat. Y'all right, he said, seating himself among the women, I'm a doctor. <clears> or <throat> the ramparts, we watched the captain stiff arms an old lady and fills the first lifeboat. <laughs> Boats is lowered jerkily by male passengers, Dr. Benway Castle. Our flag was still there. Shipwreck, <clears throat> something folks don't like to talk about. Uh, people keep trying to get in lifeboats that are already full, and some of them have to cut their fingers off with a butcher knife. <laughs> in our story, a paralyzed paritic, uh, paralyzed from the waist down, one of his hands, is the instrument someone gives him the knife and tells him what to do. <clears throat> A hand reaches out and closes along the boat side, spring like Perkins springs down the night. The hand slips away, finger stubs fall into the boat. And a boy, comrade, don't let him swamp us. The crew pull on the oars, Perkins works feverishly, cutting on all sides. His false teeth fly out with the speed of a snapping snake. Snaps him back into his mouth. Bunch of bastards, bunch of bitches. <laughs> oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wait? Barbara Cannon showed your 
reporters her souvenirs of the disaster, a light belt autographed by the crew with a severed human finger. <laughs> oh no, she said, I feel so bad about this old finger. For the land of the free and the home of the brave. Uh, I've been reading a lot of these doctor books. Dr. Benway really shines forth as a model of responsibility and competence. <laughs> and they're most of them written by doctors, and I'm not at all surprised at the extent to which the, uh, the uh, German medical profession does collaborate with the Nazis. Well, here's a comparative innocuous specimen, Mike said with some final diagnosis. Empty as an empty waiting room. This wretched specimen is falling for a 19-year-old nurse they made it out of brown clothes and a reek of mystic clean. He has proposed, she has accepted. Then she comes down with bone cancer. We have to take off the left leg, step, scapels cross it has and spread. Does he still want her? She tells him to take five days and think it over. He does. With bleak clarity, he sees the years to come in little flashes. Oh, yes, he can see where his own interests are involved. He is striding towards surgery. Big man on camp, on complex now. It takes gut to practice surgery, he says. <clears throat> striding towards surgery, though the patient is clearly terminal. He went operate on the mummy. And she is shaving along on her prosthetic. Will you shake the lead out? I'm doing the best I can, darling. Why don't you go back to her clutches, he thinks irritably aloud. He says, why don't you jet the pill on your stinking parts? <laughs> Admittedly, his words are somewhat unkind. But cancer does. Of course, it's not her fault she is in this loathsome condition, or is it? His mother always said, Son, in this life, everyone gets exactly what they want and exactly what they deserve. People tend to believe it, so long as they are getting what they think they deserve. <clears throat> Incongruously, Mike thinks of an old joke, the eternal traveling salesman. Oh, agonist of the eternal dirty joke. The salesman spots an attractive woman in the club car. As fate would have it, she is in the lower bunk, just opposite his upper bunk. And he is given in the eye. She takes off her wig. She pops out a glass eye. She spits out her false teeth. She unhooks her wooden leg. <laughs> Looks up at him pertly and says, Is there anything you want? You know what I want. Take it off and throw it up here. <laughs> he starts laughing. She demands why. And finally, he tells her, and she hits him with her throat snapping for five stitches. <clears throat> the medical rights of 1999. It is estimated that 10,000 doctors, medical bureaucrats, directors of pharmaceutical companies were massacred in the week of the long scaffolds. <laughs> Killings were not by any means random, the riders had a list. There's the bastard letting pass a kidney stone in the emergency room. It stacked up and up unnecessary operations, paying patients dying in the emergency room. We cannot accept medical admissions from emergency. Animals, uh, ambulance calls disregarded. Potentially beneficial and harmless products and treatments kept off the market. Lethal products kept on the market. A recent example was the so-called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for arthritis. In England, eight people died of liver failure, and they just don't take it off the market. They just keep changing the trade name. It was the Burns unit walkout set it off. 
Now, I have this from nurses who have worked in burn units. Absolutely no morphine or other painkiller is ordered for the patient. Otherwise, there could be danger of addiction for patients who may be under treatment for months. Even the dying are denied morphine if they have the misfortune to die in the burn unit. The doctor of my nurse and woman protests the patients will be dead by, in 12 hours. Don't you think I know that? This is the burn unit. We are under burn unit rules. Every day, burn unit patients have the raw cavities scrubbed out with a stiff brush and the patients scream with agony and few nurses can take it. A team Amateur astronauts who call themselves the spacers landed in the burn unit when their homemade space rocket exploded. After the first scrub, they issued an ultimatum morphine every four hours or we walk out. What is this nonsense? There will be no morphine, you're not going anywhere. Meet my brother, the lawyer, doctor. You propose to hold these people against their will? For their own goods. If they leave the hospital, they will be dead in 10 days from infections. And they set up a private clinic in the law. And there was a clash with police raiders searching for narcotics. Three patients shot to death. And the walkout spreads like a forest fire. Morphine a walk. Mow, mow, mow. Knocked us all the ground uneasily like camel scenting danger. In 17th century London, everybody got fed up with the lawyers and the cry went up, kill all the bloody lawyers. <laughs> Whereupon, even the most elderly and infirm scrambled off the agility of rats or evil spirits. Hampered by an inflated self-image, the healers did not put themselves so well. What are we waiting for, a hospital bed? Kill all the fucking croakers. Security steps nimbly aside and the crowds rush in. Now this piece, uh, I just want to say that it's, it's um, doesn't reflect my uh, opinions at all, but it's uh, sort of the official wasp um, position, um, and I've had considerable experience with people of this genre. <laughs> I nominate the most flatly disgusting passage in current fiction, the typical interview between the young intelligence agent and the chief. When Peter walked into the office, the chief smiled. Agents have been known to get frostbite, and the chief smiled. Having trouble with you, boy? He's a bit standoffish, said Peter. Sure, he is. We'll treat a kike like a Jew and treat a high class Portuguese Jew like a kike. Come right after that. You want to get into a nice genteel country club? Well, we like nice Jews with our moms and Jew jokes. Oh. <clears throat> Peter could see the chief as some cod-eyed old exterminator. He skirmed, worm with a small seven and broke out wholesomely. I'm just beginning to realize what a cold-hearted bastard you are. The chief was pleading. He couldn't help squirming a little, but his voice was cool. Well, that's one way of putting it. I call it staying on top of an eye. Casualties could run into the millions. The billions, Peter, the billions. The chief spread his hands and smiled. Outsiders, none of our people will be touched. Operation Bunker. Just long enough for things to cool down. Then we emerge like the phoenix without, of course, the inconvenience of being burned. Just drop a few hints. Room in the bunker for the right kind of Jew. You know what I mean, right Jews. Ah, uh, they tell me Portuguese Jews is 
the best guy, like Portuguese oysters. He just swore this was true greatness. You can't fake the real thing. You are a cold-hearted bastard, he ejaculated. Why <laughs> down and back? Um, any trouble with a cracker boy? Not a peep. I gave him the old white smalls right down the line like you told me. What are you doing over there with a the nigger in the age? Why don't you come over here where you belong and act like a white man? He swallowed that, did he? I thought he would. Well, I guess it's in the rag, Mary. One menstruating cunt said to another, and the cheek smiled so dirty. Is Colonel Bradfield's job to investigate the practical potentials of ESP, sorcery, witchcraft, or not? He doesn't give a shit for natural laws or what is or is impossible. All he cares about are results. Bring me the ones that work. What'd you bring this old beast in here for? A withered old man dressed only in a loincloth, stiff with yellow piss stains, stinking like a snake cave in spring, sits down in a leather armchair. Fumigating the chair will be inadequate, the colonel decides. He's a natural sheep. He can throw an operative curse. I don't doubt it. He's killed by proximity. <laughs> He's got a good track record, Chief. Sure, sure, it's 80 years in the making. So how did he get that way? To be a magician, you've got to be a human in some way. Easiest way is to eat your own shit and eat it steady. Eat it in and shit it out. Eat it in again, gets evil and dirty, a stink nobody can smell and live. No trace. No way it can be traced to us. What the hell there isn't. You think the islands aren't into this shit up to the ass? They can make up the evidence we all do it. No way to trace it. Big deal. Eighty shit-eating years to turn out one old human sympathy can throw a curse if you hold him steady on target. I can train an agent in hours with untraceable poisons and toxins, electronic devices to produce irrhythmic old heartbeats since sleep he died in his sleep, dreaming about a beautiful, deadly woman. See what I mean? We don't need it. But gee, we can't throw away like anything like this. And indeed, where can we throw it? It's radioactive. Get it out of here for starters and take the chair out with it. <laughs> yes, folkloric text from the Federal Narcotics Hospital at Lexington, Kentucky, was inspired by the words of Juvenal, the ancient Roman satirist, uh, referring to Greek parasites and cyclones. A few weeks later, a worm he breaks into a sweat. You complain of a draft, he screams for his overcoat. There is an exclusive wing of Lexington reserved for the do rights who are considered good rehabilitation prospects. They get better rooms and more medication. And a do right always shows up with letters from his employer, clergyman, congressman. You know, the type falls all over himself, so like the boss's cigarette. The doctor walks into the ward. Brother Warren in here. There's one man that do rights break out in a sweat and rush around opening windows. A bit cold in here, isn't it? Immediately, the do rights see their breath in the air, snatch blankets, and funnel themselves up to a chorus of shattering teeth. Front top is brown, nose pink to the bone. Doctor, well, I got one of your buried right in the same coffin to you. You're the finest, the most decent, the most deeply humane man I have ever known. I'm putting you down for additional medication, son. Thank you, doctor. Push it as you receive the death panel. 
It's the old army game, honey, here to eternity. Get there first, just with a brown as no. Fall <laughs> down the dim gray wards and day rooms with a do wrong, honk and spit and shiver and vomit. Fucking crocker wouldn't give me a goo ball. He asked me what the American flag means to me, and I tell him, suck it in heroin, doc, and I'll suck it. <laughs> Like a king, see 
watching as a set of night the incision. You young sportsmen will ask a pimple without an electric vibrating scalpel with automatic drain and suture. All the skill is going out of surgery. Oh, no, I'll make do. Let me tell you about the time I performed an appendectomy with a rusty sardine can. Once I was taught shark without an instrument one and removed a neutron tumor with my teeth. <laughs> Incision is ready, Doctor. Doctor Benway pushes the cup into the incision and works it up and down. Blood spurts all over the nurse, the doctors, and the wall. And the cup makes a horrible sucking sound. <laughs> I think she's gone, Doctor. <laughs> well, it's all in the day's work. He walks across the room to a medicine cabinet. Some bestial drug addict has cut my cocaine with Santa Claus. <laughs> Send the boy 